Hey guys, today we're going to be doing a tutorial on how to synthesize your own kick and snare using Faceplant. So here's a little example of what I managed to whip up for you guys, and we're going to be covering the basics and kind of how to recreate this. So obviously the style of this is going to be drum and bass. You can apply these techniques to things like dubstep, house, etc., but it's going to be slightly different um, depending on the style of the drums of what you're trying to recreate, but let's jump into it. Okay, so when you're working with any drum, you've got to think of it in three components. You've got the transient, you've got the body, and then you've got the tail of the sound. So those are the three components in the time axis. And then you also have like the sort of frequency axis as well. So you have another three components there. So for example, in a kick drum, you've got the low end thump, which is below around like, you know, below 100 hertz. Then you have the thump itself, which is around 100, 120 usually. You can go higher or lower. And then you have like the the sound of the beta hitting the the skin of the drum, which will be you know up in the higher register, and that can change from you know drum to drum. You will have like the content in the kind of like you know mid range, which makes up the kind of body of the sound. Um, but that that's basically what changes how the drum um, kind of tone will, will sound. Usually, the most important element of a kick drum or a snare drum will be the fundamental. And that's usually the single lowest frequency in the snare or the kick drum. Um, and it's the thing you hear the most. It's the tone that you hear when you hear the drum hit. So if I solo this kick drum and then bring up span, we can try see the fundamental here. So the fundamental of this kick drum is sitting around uh, 70 hertz. And we can try to isolate some of these frequencies by holding control and span. So there's a sub, here's the thump, and then we've got like the beta slap at the top here. So before we dive into my patches, I'm just going to quickly open up a face plant and we're going to go from scratch here. So we're going to make a analog and we're going to turn it to a sine wave. And I'm going to teach you the basic fundamentals of making any kind of drum. So this can be transferable onto you know kicks, snares, hi hats, even um, toms. Uh, this can you know you can use this for any kind of drum and any kind of genre. So the main kind of principle behind it is a pitch envelope and a volume envelope because when you hit a drum, it decays very fast. It has a fast attack, but almost instant, and it decays very quickly. And it's the same with the pitch envelope. So a pitch envelope is basically if you think of a volume envelope as controlling the volume over time, the pitch envelope will control the pitch over time. And they both work hand in hand to make the drum sound punchy. So if I get my on-screen keyboard up now and I hit any button, you can hear that we've just got a sine wave. Now, we can disable the key tracking if we want, or we can keep the key tracking on. That depends if, for example, we're making a kick drum that we want to keep in tune with the song. We can then you know, leave the key tracking on and then move the fundamental with the keyboard. But if you want to turn the key tracking off, you can turn the harmonic off to zero and then just tune the kick with this shift knob here. So now any key that I press is going to be the same tone. So let's make the fundamental like around, let's say, 70, 80 hertz. So we could edit the envelope that we have here in this section, but we're going to actually add in our own envelopes in the modulators section just because we have more control over the shape of it. So if we go here, and instead of doing envelope, we're actually going to do an LFO. The reason for this is because the envelope you know, is basically the same as this one here. So you have, you have some good control, but I want more kind of granular control over the envelope as a whole. So we're going to put it on LFO, and then we're going to turn to one shot. Now, what we can do is we could edit the envelope here with this pencil button and it'll bring it up. So for like an envelope for a kick drum or something, we would have it you know, starting high and then we'd bring it down to the zero point. So if you hold shift, or is it control? Yeah, if you hold control, you can snap it to this grid and you can increase the size of the grid up here as well. So if you want more refined uh, vertical points here, you can set the grid a bit higher and then hold control and then it will snap. So if we then bring this down as well, so this is look, starting to look more like an envelope. So we want like a very kind of sharp transient here, and then it starts to trail off, and then we've got like a bit of a release here. So we can close this now, and now what we can do is we can automate the gain here with this envelope. So if we press here and click drag to modulate, and we bring it all the way up, and then bring the gain down so that the zero point is down here. Now if we hit the button, it should start to kick up here. So we're already starting to get that kind of fundamental transient here. So I'm actually going to pull in an envelope that I did earlier. So I'm going to go here, LFO, click, 
and I can go to my user factory, and I can bring in this envelope here. So this is the envelope that I did earlier. And as you can see, it's pretty much it's pretty similar. It's just a bit more sustain on it, basically. But we're going to use this one instead. So I'm going to close this. Also, remember to put this to one shot as well here. So we can do the same thing to automate. We can click here, drag to automate, and then now we've got a fundamental. Next stage is the pitch envelope. So if we go here, I'm going to go LFO. I'm going to grab in a pitch envelope that I did. So it's basically the same thing. It's just dialed to taste. As you can see, it's just more of a snappy, fast transient here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it on one shot, and then I'm going to put this to the shift. And then I can dial this in. This doesn't have to be to 100%. Neither does the gain here when you're automating it. But this is all like kind of down to taste here. So if I dial this in and start hitting the key. So as you can hear, when you change the amount, it's going to really, really change how kind of lasery it sounds. Another thing that's going to change how it sounds drastically is going to be the uh, rate of the LFO here. So this changes how fast it's going to happen. So if you listen. As I go slower, the pitch envelope gets slower as well. So you generally want to dial this in so it's a fairly quick click. Like that. Now we can start dialing in the fundamental frequency as well by dragging this down. And we can dial in the length of the volume LFO as well. So that's the basic principle behind creating the fundamental. Next up, you're going to need some kind of top end layer. And you can usually do this with noise. So we're going to make another group here. And we're going to go through and we're going to make a noise oscillator here. Whenever you make a new oscillator, you're going to have to put an output on it as well. So let's go do that. Now, if we hit a button, you can hear that the noise is going to start. That doesn't sound really good. So what we're going to want to do is basically just use the noise for the top end click. So we're pretty much going to do the same thing. We're just going to be adding a volume envelope. But I don't think we're really needing a pitch envelope for the top end, because most of that pitch envelope should be coming from the fundamental. So I'm going to create an LFO. I'm going to open up. And I'm going to go up to the drum envelope here. And I'm going to automate this noise layer. Now, what you could do is you could also stack all of these onto one envelope. But if you want that granular control of having maybe like a longer tail, et cetera, you're not going to be able to do that all on the same envelope. So this is where having multiple will help. So remember to put it on one shot as well. And now if we listen, and you can start to hear that the kick is actually starting to form now. So you've got the fundamental and you've got the top end. So one thing to bear in mind when you're working with noise is that there's a slope here. So when you go to the left here, it turns it to white noise. And when you turn it to the right, it turns to brown noise. So it depends on how kind of dull you want the top end of your kick. You can also filter this, which we'll do in a second. So if you listen to the difference, the right sounds quite dull. And then left, it's going to sound a lot brighter. And then in the middle, it's going to sound a bit mixed. So what we're going to do is we're going to click at the bottom here, and we're going to add in a filter. I'm going to drag it before the output here. Now we're going to turn this into a high pass and bring the cutoff up, just so we're cutting off all of that low end information. Now what we can also do is automate this cutoff for some extra movement. So we could actually just use the same thing here. So if we do this and automate it, but go the other way, that way when the kick is happening, it's going to start with a high pass that's higher up, and then it's going to start to cut, as you see here. This kind of just adds some extra movement to the kick and just kind of helps uh, glue it together a bit more, make it sound a bit more natural. So when working with stuff like kick drums, it's actually really helpful to have some kind of monitoring system, whether it be something visual like Voxingo Span or something, or you have something like a, a sub pack. Um, it can really, really help you feel that low end and kind of know what you're doing. So if I'm hitting this note here, I can really clearly feel that fundamental, and I know what I'm doing with it. And then I'm also going to be able to understand how it's phasing with other things in the mix, and also when I'm going to be applying some all pass filters on the kick drum and snare drum to then shift the phase of the low end a bit. So another thing you can do is layer in samples into your drums. Um, for example, in the kick drum, I could layer in a hi-hat on the top end to add a bit more transient to it. So if I drag this hi-hat sample in here and start playing with this, so I can move this to its other group as well. So if I do this, add a new group. And then I add an output. I don't really need to make an envelope for this because I'm, you know, it's already a drum, so I can just kind of leave it as is. But I could also adjust the envelope here if I really wanted to. So as you remember before, we had the harmonic off, and we played with the shift to determine the fundamentals. So we can do the same with the hi hat, so that when we play different notes, 
it's not pitching up. So turn off the harmonic and then we can shift it up and then find where we want this to sit. And then we can also reduce the release a bit, maybe bring down the sustain and work with the decay a bit. And then as you go along, you can then tweak and tweak the, the speeds and the releases to get your kick drum sitting exactly where you want. You can also reference other drums to kind of try mimic them. That's going to help you a lot as well. So if we go open up the kick patch here, what we can do is look through it. If I disable all of the lanes, so disable them one by one. So we've already covered the layer basics, like the fundamental, the noise, and then the hi-hat layer here. So if we listen to it raw here, this is obviously the product of me sitting down for a while and tuning the uh, envelopes quite a lot. And that's all it is, really. Then if we start to run this into a distortion, we're also automating the drive a bit so that it goes up as it hits. You can hear how that's going to add a bit more crunch to the drum as well. In this patch, I didn't actually disable the key tracking. So when I was playing, I was actually playing on a C1. So if I go to make sure that I'm playing a C1, then this is what it should sound like. Now, the second layer, this is probably one of the most important ones. You, so you can do drums without using Disperser, but Disperser is an insanely useful tool for um, affecting the phase past a certain point. And you can make this drum sound like it's pushing almost. So if you listen to the drum before and after Disperser, you just listen to how it changes it. So on the sub pack, I can feel that the low end is kind of sucking in rather than just immediately happening. And then also you can sort of hear like this lasery tone that's happening. And that's really, really useful because it can actually help the kick drum kind of cut through the mix as opposed to if I didn't have that on, the drum might sound a bit woody and just kind of like it's, it's hitting, but it's like not really punching me. So it's down to a taste thing. Sometimes drums work better without something like this on them. But when you're synthesizing, Disperse can be a really, really cool tool. So if I turn off Disperser and add in my own one, so I can kind of show how to dial it in. For example, if we just use Disperser as, it, as is, it's going to sound really lasery. So if we bring down the amount quite a bit, and then maybe we can up the pinch as well. So as you might be able to hear if you're using headphones, or if you've got a sub pack or a sub, or some good monitors, is that the low end phase is actually getting offset a bit here, and you're getting this nice kind of delayed effect. So we're going to put that back on. Now if we go to the limiter, all this is doing is just catching the peaks. Then we have to go to this multipass. Now this is where the multiband compression comes in. So if I open this multipass, basically all I've done is just done a multiband compression. So if I disable these and do one by one and solo them, you listen to the low end. Without, with, without. So it's actually just emphasizing that kick transient just a bit. So the the settings I've got going here is just like around 30 milliseconds of attack. The ratio is just about four to one, I think. Yeah, three to three point four to one. And we're only reducing by around like four dB here. Same with the bid range. So if we listen to the mid range. Actually just, it's just making that drum snappier, and then the high end as well. It's just increasing that transient ever so slightly. So without the compression, so, so without the compression, with. Then we've got a slice EQ. This is just corrective EQ here. So I felt like it needed a low boost here, and then a mid-range cut, and then some high mids, and then a high end boost. So if I open up the filter section here, you can see what I've got. This is actually disabled, this one here. But this white line is the resultant EQ. If I disable, for example, this one, 
you can see how it changes here. So without the EQ and with, I'll show it. So without, with, a lot more weight in that low end that I can feel now. And then it's not so muddy with this mid-range kind of tamed as well. And this is being reduced by about 4 dB and boosted right about 4 dB here as well. This is about 2 dB or 3 and then about four again. So that's just gonna be down to um, how much experience you have with kind of knowing what frequencies to cut and boost. There's no kind of real like, you know, exact kind of template you can use each time. It's just gonna be down to what the sound needs. And unfortunately that's just gonna be down to you doing this over and over and kind of learning as you go. And then at the end, final limiter, just to kind of catch everything. So that's the final kick drum. For the snare drum, it's pretty much the same thing. I'm not gonna go and start one from scratch, but I'm gonna show you each individual element here. So I'm turning off all the effects and I'm gonna turn off each layer and just show them one by one, because there's quite a few layers. So when it comes to building drums, it's all about layering and then doing precise kind of changes on each of the layers until you start building up like some kind of full sound here. So it's very tedious a lot of the time and it, it requires just a lot of patience and like, you know, thinking, oh, I might need this here, this there. Um, but I'll try to show this. So for the fundamental, we just got this tone here. Now I actually have key tracking on this because then I can change the fundamental of the snare if I want to, dependent on if I want to actually tune it to the song, etc. So if I hover over the automations here, you'll see that the level is being automated by this envelope, which is pretty much the same thing. And then the pitch envelope is pretty much the same as the kick drum, which is just this. Next area is this noise layer here. So if we listen to this, this is where a lot of that kind of upper mid range and high end comes from is this noise layer. So same thing as the kick drum, I'm automating the cutoff and I'm automating the gain here. And that's all it is. Third layer is this acoustic drum layer. So this is actually from uh, addictive drums. I think it's this layer here, but there's something different that we've done with it. So if we look towards this layer here, this is actually the envelope that I've done for the snare. And the reason for this is that I don't want the organic transient fighting with the fundamental because it's just going to sound like it's clashing and it's going to sound like it's flaming. So what I want to do is fade out that transient, have the body here, and then start to have it releasing here. And as you can see, I'm not actually going fully to zero yet. And I actually have it kind of hold this release for a bit, just have a bit more of a tail. So if we listen now, you can see even here on the gain, how it kind of fades out quicker than here where it's like very snappy. Kind of takes the time to fade out here. So I have a clap layer here. So this is actually a clap from Phase Parts Factory Sound Bank here. So it's just right here. So it's pretty much the same thing. I've just done a normal envelope here, as you can see. Very, very subtle change. So as you can see, this is where all those kind of minute additions kind of help build up. But another noise layer here, because I think I wanted a bit more top end. And as you can see, I've got the same kind of automation, almost like the acoustic layer, but it's slightly different here. So fade in the transient, got the body, and then it releases. Also, we've got the filter cutoff automation here as well. Another layer, here's a sample, hi-hat, for an extra bit of top end transient. And then we've got another noise layer here as well. This one's got some distortion on it. And this is being automated by a similar curve down here. So this has got no transient here. So it totally depends on how many layers you've already got fighting in that space. You basically just want one layer of transient information usually in each frequency range. So, you know, only one thing hitting in the top end, one thing hitting in the lows, one thing hitting in the mids. Otherwise you're gonna start getting this conflicting information and the transient isn't gonna sound as clean. Then we got another noise layer here. This adds more mid range. And that's all the layers. Then we're going to add in our distortion here. So if we listen without it, with it, really starts to drive that fundamental out and even the top end as well. And we've got this drive being automated here as well. So adding automation, like envelope automation and stuff like that to different parameters can make something move and not sound so static because otherwise it, it can just sound really kind of stagnant. 
Then we're going to our second lane here. So if we listen to this other layer of distortion. So something else to bear in mind is that I've sent different kind of elements to different layers. So most of these are to lane one, which is going through this distortion. But I also have things going to lane two, which is pretty much the same distortion. The reason I did this was because I wanted to add a chorus. I didn't really want to add a chorus to the main fundamental, which then would make it sound washy and the transient wouldn't be as punchy. So if you want to add anything like a chorus, etc., try to run the fundamental through something that isn't going through that. And that way you're going to get a nice clean transient and you're not going to kind of mess with that stereo information and it's going to, it's just going to sound bad. So that's why I've got all the like most of the noise stuff going through lane two to then kind of make it a bit more washy. And the transients, for example, the hi-hat transient, uh, the snare sample here, like the uh, acoustic one, we've got the original noise layer for the top end and also the fundamental going through only lane one. And then lane one, as you can see here, is going to lane three. So it's skipping lane two, and they're both going to lane three. So this is basically like my master channel. So if we listen to lane two and lane one together with the distortions, and now with the chorus on top, it's like a very slight change because I've actually added in the chorus and had the mix down and then I put the spread all the way up. So it's just adding that extra bit of stereo information. So now if we move to lane three, we can see the biggest changes. So disperser on and off. This one is actually gonna give you a lot of that transient punch below this, below this mark here. And then the multi-pass is gonna be one of the biggest ones as well. So this is with the compression on it. Same pretty much settings as last time. So around 4 dB of reduction for each layer, and the attack is usually around 30 milliseconds, if not 40 just to let that transient through. So if we listen with and without, really, really brings out that transient. And as you can see, I'm actually soloing the low end out here. So this is the fundamental here, the mid range, and then the highs. And then again, a slice EQ to do some corrective stuff. So we've got a fundamental boost here, a top end slap boost here, and then a noise boost. So with and then without. Just adds a bit more bite. And we've got a limiter to catch everything. Okay, so that's the kick and the snare. Then for the hi-hats, um, I didn't synthesize these, but it's actually not that hard to synthesize hi-hats. Um, basically, you're just gonna do the same thing as we did with the kick and snare. Just do a volume envelope. You can do a bit of a pitch envelope for the transient as well. There are some really, really good hi-hat patches in here. So if we load up Faceplant, we can go into either the drums folder for some hi-hats, or we could go into sequences. There's a nice one here. I had sequencer, and if we hold a button, you can just kind of go through this and kind of deconstruct it. Um, like, you know, there's a disperser, a transient shaper on it, some distortion limiter, a bit of reverb, and then it's only literally just one noise oscillator going through a distortion and a filter. And then all of this is just sequencing stuff here to add in some more variation, because that's where the kind of trip lies in doing drums is adding in that kind of variation in the hits to make it not sound so robotic. So what I did is I actually use some uh, acoustic hats just to tie in the drums together. Because I'm already synthesizing the kick and snare, I wanted a bit more of a human sounding element into the drum set. So if you just listen to the hi-hats, it's actually addictive drums, but I've got two layers. So one is the acoustic layer, and then the other layer is a synth layer. And then together, the synth layer actually gives you more of a clean mono signal, especially on the top end, so it punches through the mix. And the acoustic layer kind of helps tie everything together. So if I disable the synth layer, you can hear how it kind of sounds a bit more soft. And then with it. Now if we listen to the drums all together, so all three, this is how it kind of sounds together. Now, the last thing to tie together, this is mainly for drum and bass, is doing a ghost snare. So what I did is I actually just copied the drums. This is pretty much the same thing as a snare, just with some less layers, because I, I actually copied this before I started making more changes to it. So the ghost snare is actually the same drum, but it's actually just a lot snappier. So if you hear the difference here, that versus this. So all this does is helps you add in some kind of nice kind of variation in between the hits here. So all I did was I just changed the envelopes to be a lot shorter. So for example, as you can see, it's just a lot snappier. It comes down to zero way quicker. 
as opposed to kind of the more drawn out kind of envelopes, especially for this layer here. Instead of it kind of going out like this and drawing out that way, it kind of just goes to zero very quickly. And then with all three layers together, it sounds a bit like this. So I hope that tutorial helps you out a bit with starting to synthesize some drums in Faceplant using your sub pack. Um, if you want, you can use my code actually to get 15% off of your sub pack and you can get 10% off of any Kilohertz product using the links in the description below and using my code PROTOSTAR. Um, but yeah, hope you enjoy this tutorial and also the subsequent ones as well. So see you later.